Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Ava. Uh, thank you for sharing your lunchtime with us, and thank you for coming to uh, listen to this talk. Thank you, Cecilia, for coming here today and sharing your thoughts with us, and we're all very anxious to hear about your year of forgetting. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to introduce uh, Mila Pinnigan, who is our exhibition manager, who will in turn officially introduce Cecilia. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? OK. <laughs> um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Cecilia Kane. She is a nationally exhibiting artist with 20 solo shows since earning her MFA from Georgia State University in 1997. She's a painter, fabric artist, uh, and a performance artist, as well as video and earth artist, whose work delves inside the universe of self and being. Cecilia Kane has performed and exhibited at many art venues across the USA. She is a curator, visiting artist, guest lecturer, performer, community artistic project director, teacher, and graphic producer as well. Cecilia currently lives and creates in Peachum, Vermont, which is gorgeous. <laughs> and that's just a two hour drive from Rutland, Vermont, where she spent much of her childhood. She proudly traces her ancestry to men and women who arrived in Vermont from the Irish potato famine and served in the American Civil War, farmed, and worked on the Rutland Railroad. Um, this was a really fun and vibrant show to work on with Cecilia, and uh, I'm just so thrilled that she's here to share um, some thoughts with us. So without any further ado, Cecilia Kane. Thinking. Feeling. Forgetting. Hmm. 
So can you hear me? <laughs> All right. Um, you've just witnessed my brain and my heart talking to each other in symbols. I made up these symbols a couple years ago, and I started to notate in my sketchbook all the different ways I was starting to forget. And I wanted to make a, a calendar or a map, some way to kind of get control of it. <laughs> I discovered you don't get control of it, but um, I have in the past used daily record keeping as a way to figure out who I am, kind of like self-portraiture. These paintings use symbols and represent the mental lapses, the mental me. Um, so I guess it was at the beginning, I started um, with color and using these symbols, um, each one represents a day. And the paintings are either a month in this year or two months together. And um, I would start in the middle. That would be, say, September 2nd. And this kind of billowing shape was just a general confusion. There were shapes. I made a key. In trying to make these maps, um, this spiky thing was a um, complete blank, like meeting someone on the street and they'd know me and I would not know them at all. Um, a simple forgetting, like the kind I always did, where are my keys? Or when somebody finished my sentences for me, like I was missing a word and they would just jump in and help out. <laughs> and I would try to remember when I got home with my notebook what the forgetting was so that I would get the right symbol. But I had to make a symbol uh, which was like little hairy, hairy, I guess I didn't, oh there, here. Not, when I got home, I would not remember what it was that I had forgotten. So having a symbol for not remembering what I couldn't remember <laughs> was important. <laughs> and, and I'm glad you're laughing because my intent was to, whoops, um, my intent was to make fun of forgetting my dear, departed mom would be in a panic when she would forget. She would discover her wallet in the freezer and say, when we opened the freezer and found it there for no reason, she would just, she had a sense of humor. She'd say, oh, my frozen assets. And <laughs> that would be fine. <laughs> so I come from a a line of jokers, I guess. I wanted the work to be playful, colorful. Some people have said to me that children would enjoy it. And I do think you can look at them without knowing what the background of all them, the work is. I thought I'd just point out um, this first painting I did. It's called September. And this was the original map. So it started out as being a calendar with a biological uh, scroll work or scaffolding. And this is when I started doing the symbols. There are literally seven days, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the first week. And I'd always start in the middle with these spiky things, for example, and then add on a forgetting. This one here represented a forgetting that the lobes that I remembered maybe three days later. And, um, and then there were shapes, little circular dashes that represented immediately remembering. What was that guy's name? 
oh yeah, blah, blah. So seven, 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 and seven, the simplest way. Um, after this, I'm taking down the show, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I, you know, created, say, a thought bubble or a head, something to represent the brain, and I just floated them in it, and they crossed over and touched each other. And since living in Peacham, Vermont, I'm fascinated with the wildness up there. So there are some places where nature has popped in, like on that light pastel green one. The eyes, which I dropped later on, the blue and the red one don't have eyes, neither does this pastel and charcoal one in the far left. Because um, I was using it to represent the me looking at my mind or the seeing from the inside. And I don't know, I just finished with that. Um, I don't know if I have anything more to say except that they were fun to do and I would finish one about every month last year. I finished, um, let's see, the red one, is that July, August? Yep. Okay, and that would have been this past July, August's forgettings and I did them in uh, October. So I was always a few months behind, hoping I would finish a full year by the time January arrived, so. I, um, I have a, two other projects that um, use the same process. I like to record things and I've thought a lot about it. Why do I do so many projects that require me to re repeat? Uh, um, I'll tell you first a little bit before we look at them maybe. Um, I was raised Catholic, Irish Catholic, and Catholicism has a bunch of uh, counting kinds of prayers. And the idea, like when you say the rosary, there are five decades or five groups of 10 prayers. You hold an intention, you ask a question, and the idea is if you keep repeating the same prayer, at the end you might get an answer to your question. There are 14 stations of the cross. There are novenas, which are nine prayers that you can say for nine weeks or nine months or however many nines you want to do it in. Again, walking the stations of the cross, you hold this prayer in your mind. I want to be able to um, give this speech and get you all interested in this work and say a prayer again and again and again and again. So I am not um, that kind of praying person now, but I know that I am still using that method as a scaffolding, so to speak, for getting a handle on who I am. So, would you uh, open the... There are two more projects I will briefly mention. This one, um, I'm actually still in the process of doing. Uh, back in uh, 2009, I asked myself, how am I feeling today? I thought that might be um, a way of approaching who am I again. I knew that Descartes had said that we're basically our thoughts. Cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, but I was feeling that I feel therefore I am. Sensio ergo sum, I made that up. but. <laughs> <laughs> but so I went in the bathroom every morning for 89 days and I just said, quick, quick, how are you feeling? And in this one, I was feeling healthy. I wrote it on my head in lipstick and 42 was the day. That was the day. Day 42, I was feeling healthy. And um, 
I snapped a picture, a selfie. We didn't call them selfies back in 2009. <laughs> but, um, and then I proceeded, you can click on it and there's, on my website, there are um, all 89, that's bored, this is kind of, yeah, calm. In my same bathroom, feeling cosmic is that one. I guess I was feeling existential or something. <laughs> and queasy. And I discovered... Creaky? Uh, creaky, yes, very <laughs> creaky. My, my joints were not <laughs> feeling very good. Itchy, rushed, and 89. So uh, I discovered that I, after this whole project, that I am not my feelings because I would leave the bathroom and start feeling something else. <laughs> so I still don't have a handle on it, but uh, we can go back out of the selfies and see the second phase, um, the drawings. I did portraits. This, these are all healthy. So in this one, I'm not taking a, uh, a por doing a portrait of me, actually. It is me, but it's more trying to make a portrait of the feelings. That's cosmic. And again, 89, that's the queasy. So I used a whole bunch of media on paper, trying to get across, again, my feelings to myself. And those were done probably in 20, uh, 11 and 12, a lot of them. They're all like uh, size of um, legal paper. And then to the hankies. I love fabric work. And uh, I found in my mom's attic a little hat box filled with uh, over 100 handkerchiefs, family hankies. And I took my, um, those same initial photographs and hand laser printed them. I opened up the hankies, taped them to paper, and just ran them through my HP desktop. And it, some of them, like this one, I don't know if we can hold that. Um, yeah, this one, it had a little embroidery on it already, and it bounced. And there was a big smudge up at the top over the head, so I just accentuated it. And I added uh, acrylic to the eyes. And what I did later to all of these <clears throat> is I started quilting them and beading them and doing a little painting. So I am not finished. Those 89 are taking a long time. And I do them at night when I'm sitting just, you know, kind of lap work, my mother would call it, or fancy work. Um, I was doing one in Rutland in the uh, park there on Main Street, and an elderly woman, I mean, I'm a senior, but this woman was very elderly, and she said, my goodness, I haven't seen anybody do fancy work in a long time, so. Um, They'll, they were started around the time of the drawings, and I just do those slowly at night. And again, I know I am not my feelings. 89 is significant. Um, it's my mother's lifespan, and she is, this is an identity piece just like these are identity pieces. And my mother was a major identity figure in my life. We were like this sometimes, and other times very close, so. Um, I guess maybe we could go to the second project. Okay, this is called Hand to Hand. And this is not about me. When the Iraq War started, I had been working with those uh, white archivist gloves that you'd wear if you were holding film, perhaps, or a rare book. And I just took it upon myself, maybe if you 
click on 2003, I started the first day of the Iraq War. And I, yeah, you can do January. I started with, um, wait, will it go on? No. So March is fine. Okay. <laughs> so I just did, um, I dated the fingers, 32003, and I used like stick figures on stuffed gloves. And it is a, the headline of the day, 12 dead copter crash. And they were kind of cartoonish. Later, if you go to 2005, Yeah, mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, like down in October would be fine. Uh, later on, I started to make, you can click on anyone. Uh, yeah, that's the Senate defies Bush okays anti-torture measure 10605. So it became a daily little painting. And Bush, 9-11 uh, linked to Iraq reasserted. And that's Saddam Hussein in the middle. So I actually have the, um, every single darn headline from the Iraq war. But I had a show of the first three years and in the, at the Atlantic Contemporary Arts Center. That was about 900 gloves and they filled the space. Just the, it, incredible. And then I decided that I was going to stop just because it was taking up all of my time. And a couple artists at that closing uh, of the show said, you cannot stop. The war is in full swing in 2005. We'll help. So, but we have to change your, the media. Now some have had been working with gloves. It's called hand to hand, so f gloves need to be in there. But um, if we go back to the um, main mm -hmm. page, yeah. Um, and then just on hand to hand, maybe it'll come up. Yeah. People started uh, doing videos. One of the artists started, uh, did a week of videos. Everyone signed up for a week. Some of the artists were so excited, they said, we don't want to wait, we'll do our week now. And I said, no, <laughs> it has to be based on the news story of that week, you have to wait. And I actually wanted some people, I was against the war, but there were friends who were more, I, not pro-war, but pro-soldiers, I guess. And one person said, I don't want to use the newspaper. I'm going to write emails to my brother who is on a warship in the Gulf of, I am forgetting, the, uh, the bay that comes up into Saudi Arabia or whatever. And his response, about what he did that day, that week, were her news stories, kind of giving honor to the soldiers as well. But this image is from uh, Western Kentucky University Gallery. And that, you, it just, it kept going on and on and on, you know. Sculptural gloves, fabric gloves, and each day people had to record a, a reaction to the war. I produced a book with everyone's statements. You can get it on Blurb. Uh, and I thought maybe we'd show you one or two gloves. Uh, if you go to 2007, December, uh, Teresa Bramlett Reeves, for example, um, this one, she crocheted her gloves mm -hmm. to start with. And <coughs> there are two roses, that's all, on hers. And she said that the roses represented the American soldiers that died that day. So that day, two passed away. <coughs> and that day, uh, she did not include it in her glove, but 
to 12.25.07, so on Christmas Day. And of course, she did it in red and green. Then, if you click on that one, th this one has some beads here and there. And there's another one with, uh, I think this has lots of beads in it, all in here. They're very tiny seed beads. Two American soldiers died, and lots of the little beads represented Iraqi citizens. There were usually many more that died from Iraq. So, uh, and then if you go back again to um, 2007, I think it was June that my another, this, uh, right down, yeah, um, mm -hmm. Scott Schult, he's an artist in Seattle, he decided that his gloves would be armored, because at that time there was not enough armored vehicles and American soldiers were getting IED attacks all the time. He made armor. I do not know what the metal was now, but he etched the news story into his gloves mm -hmm. and um, he sewed them onto Kevlar, which is the bulletproof material. So his whole piece was that week there was an awful lot of soldiers' deaths because of not being protected enough. So, um, and then one more glove. <laughs> Back in 2010, uh, yeah, I think March, yes, there were several, all of these works here were by um, refugee children who came to uh, Clarkston, Georgia. I do not know the group that helped resettle them. And they were all from war-torn countries like Burundi. Um, let's see, here, this one here is uh, Rafal al kashali She's from Iraq. And um, she worked with Nazrin Safi from Afghanistan. These were girls of high school age. And they contributed as well. Here's another one that I think represents the Iraq uh, flag. And it says it's talking about sadness and death. And uh, so I stopped this project finally in 2010, December. Uh, the uh, war was basically slowing down, and President Obama said that by December 31st, all, all um, combat troops would be out of Iraq, and they were. I mean, there were still going to be the advisors and contractors, but I thought, we have got over 2,000 artworks. It has been in 15 venues from California to Buffalo, Nashville, Kentucky, Vermont, uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, Chicago, um, not Chicago, artists from Chicago, but um, Los Angeles in two places, Atlanta. Um, it, it, had, it had served its purpose, I think, and the artists um, got a chance. What they wanted to do is they felt powerless they wanted to just say something. So we did that daily. So do you have any questions about this work or some things about what I've said? Yeah. I'm interested in how you felt when you completed one of these months. Did it give you a sense of serenity, mm -hmm. of fruition, mm -hmm. or possibly a sense of discipline freedom? How, how did you feel once you finished? Was it something good or mm -hmm. the fact that it was depressing because you'd forgotten? Yeah. Um, no, the depressing part was doing the notebook, I think. 
just making a recording of it. I was starting to worry when I finished the paintings whether I should continue because um, I thought, well, maybe by doing all these recordings and concentrating so much on, well, what kind of a forgetting is that, that I was actually maybe encouraging my forgetting. I don't know. So, but doing the paintings was fun. Uh, I felt like I was, I think I said in the statement, like I was poking fun at um, aging, at a disability, so to speak. I felt good about it. Yeah. Yeah. They are lighthearted. Lighthearted, yes. Yeah. Playful. Mm -hmm. But they are also, I think, because you are an artist that's worked for a long time. They're beautifully composed. Everything about it, on the artistic level, mm -hmm. as you said, you could come in here and spend a long time and not know anything but what you chose to see. Yeah, I think that sometimes when we have intention that's messaging, mm -hmm. um, balance might not be there. But yeah, these are so I really like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the past, uh, early art, I would literally put text in. In case you didn't know what this was about, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> and it didn't uh, work as well. Some do, I think. But for me, uh, as I've, I entered the art world late. I'm, in 1997, I got my um, MFA. And that's what, 25, 20 some odd years ago. However, I was um, already up there. There were a lot more younger people in the uh, class. I felt like I was finally doing what I wanted to do. But um, it's been a process and I try to make it fun. Yeah. Would you have done this without the MFA? Hmm. Are you asking, did the MFA somehow help me develop? Yeah. One of the things that surprised me uh, when I first went to Georgia State, I did not have a BFA. So they wanted me to bring a body of work before a panel to see if what my level was. I didn't even know to bring slides, it was slides back then. I basically brought big boxes of artwork <laughs> to show. And uh, one of the first things I discovered in the class was that they wanted me to come up with a theme. You were supposed to be working, you just didn't produce art. You were working, it was like thinking about who, what am I trying to say in this world? So yes, the MFA definitely did help me. It kind of honed me in on, oh, art can be this wonderful expression, but it can also be a statement of how I live in the world. They encourage that. And then your final thesis show is about a subject, so. Okay. No more questions. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.